so excited to see what you're, the Lord's going to speak through you tonight. So. Lord, we do uh, humble ourselves before you. Our hearts truly are, Lord, for you to go deep, deeper than what we've known you to be thus far. Lord, we ask you tonight to go deeper still. Lord, we realize the journey has begun. It's not ended. And in this journey... We know there is so much more of you that desires to possess us. We would say to our inward man, swing wide you everlasting doors and let the king of glory come more fully in to more fully possess us, to more fully control us. We welcome that, Lord. We do not consider it an infringement of our rights. We welcome you, Lord in lordship we welcome you in kingship we welcome you lord to be in control of us instead of ourselves go deep lord deep nothing shallow but go deep past my own mind's resistance, my own doctrinal disagreements, my own hesitations and fears and that which I'm unwilling to relinquish. But Lord, we would say to you, we truly want you to do in us all that you desire and be more than that, to be in us all that you desire to be. Help my heart not to be afraid, Lord, to fully release myself into your hands. I come into agreement with you, Lord, that I, we, were created not only by you, but we were created for you. To belong to you, to not live for ourselves, but for you to live in and through us. That, Lord, you bought and purchased us as well, that we might be yours. So again, Lord, come in. Deeper, Lord, past our simple minds, our natural or carnal mind. Go deep. Disrupt us inwardly and seize the reins of our inward man. We bless you, Lord that you've not only heard this prayer, but, Lord, you are and will take us up on it. So we thank you. Be it done unto us according to our prayer, Lord. Seize the reins. Amen. Well, it is good to be with you guys. Always is. I have my wife here with me and Andy and Heidi from Tennessee, who's a part of the... Uh, the gathering there and long-term friends with ours that traveled some with us as they are this time and always a joy to come and be with the Kesslers who we love dearly the whole family and with you guys many of you who live here many of you who don't live here who we get to see regularly that's a joy always is and always will be um, you know I, I uh, come into this time really with the burden of the Lord operating in me in such a way as God, not only us, but my own heart, make me ready for what uh, is upon us. It's not coming, it's upon us. It's only going to uh, grow in its intensity, either side, however you look at it. It's not all evil, certainly isn't all Christ either. 
I wish it was. Don't you? I wish it was just all the Lord. I wish that's where we were in history, but that's not where we are. So the challenge is on in our time, these types of days, to uh, go deep with the Lord. We're not going to find a utopia externally here. We're going to have to find the Lord internally to be not only our satisfaction and our dwelling place, but to be our security. Now, He has promised that He would be that to us. It's going to demand trust on our part. A trust, perhaps, that's not in me yet, but I want the Lord to be in me in that way, to where I do trust Him. Easy to say that when things are going well. It's in the difficult times when everything is tested. And uh, the Lord allows the difficulties, if doesn't send them, He at least allows them to test trust. Every relationship is built on trust. That's the question the Lord so often brings to me. Do you trust me? And still, after all these years, he's still asking that. There, I know there's a reason. So these times prove that out, guys. I've, if I ask the question tonight of everyone that's in the room, who's just doing exceptionally well and everything's smooth and couldn't be better, I dare say there'd be very few that would raise their hands. And if you did, none of the rest of us would believe you. <laughs> That's how bad it is with all of us. Or good, depending on how you see that. It's a perspective. It <clears throat> depends on what the Lord's doing in this moment. Well, the Lord for, certainly, for certain is doing this. He's doing an inward work in His people. That is a sure steadfast truth no matter what. Also with that, he's using outward things to help perform that work, including relationships. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> so um, my encouragement is to us in this way is that the Lord is going to be bigger in us than what's in this world. He did promise that. He's greater. I need to let him be greater, which means he will break, he will break my constraints of him, not only on the outward but in the inward. And it's in the inward. When God turns inward uh, and specifically targets our inward man, that the challenge comes at a level that perhaps we're unfamiliar and uncomfortable with. Everything gets brought to question, and then the Lord uses the outward that we thought was all put away to attack the inward. Now, if you're not going through that right now, don't hurry. You will. Don't rush it. Seriously. That's not, it's not, well, maybe I will. No, you will. It's only a matter of time. But that is the work of the Lord. And I only bring it up to encourage us because one of the worst things in this is when we're going through things, think, man, I don't know. I, just be, I must be totally backslidden. God doesn't listen to me anymore, doesn't care about me. None of that is true. But that's where the enemy will take it quickly and accuse you. And So I'm simply saying this to you, to be ready for the battles. The Lord is doing an inward work. We're certain of that. And I've been certain, as I'm sure you are, he's using outward things in that work. Not only outward, but he is using the outward. So, but anyway, my burden during this time has been to uh, the Lord's burden in me has been this whole concept of a prepared people. I've been saying this for several years. I'll keep saying it. I can't see an end to it because I don't see an end to the increase of Christ. I only see uh, him becoming more and more within us, as well as among us. So this weekend is not going to be any different. I'm going to talk to us about the need of inward preparation. And uh, I think we're learning. I am. I'm wanting to learn. Let me say it that way. So much of the Lord I don't know. That doesn't frighten me, but it is a fact. 
doesn't make me want to run away and hide to say that to you. There's so much of him, way more of him than what I will ever know. Not only could know, but will ever. If we were to exhaust what we call time. No creation would ever arrive at the full knowledge of God. Not ever. He is quite beyond finding out, but yet wanting to reveal himself. So it doesn't discourage me at all to realize I'm in this moment with him and I'm a babe and I'm okay with that. I'm not acting like I'm not a babe. I'm content to bring him to bring to me the singleness of focus to know the Lord. That I need to know him. I want to know him. Not out here, but in here where true life is, and true transformation takes place. So I don't want pride to ever cloud my judgment in this, to think I'm someplace I'm not. I'm in Christ as a babe, needing to know him. A few short years, that's all you can be as a babe. A few short years that we live in this life, that's all we're going to be as babes in one sense when it comes to the vastness of the knowledge of God. I'm not saying children in a wrong way here. I'm saying in a comparison way. I want to encourage all of our hearts in this stretching time that we're in, in the challenging time that we're in, we're not the first to go down this path and we won't be the last. There have been many of our brothers and sisters before us who walked this path after the Lord who felt exactly like what we feel right now and have found what we must come to know, God is quite beyond us. He gets us quickly out of our depth. And he, believe me, he can take you there quickly. To where we're outside of our depth, we're in waters that we have never been in before. Concerning the knowledge of God, I'm talking about knowing the Lord. So God is moving upon our soul's own strong will to think that it knows God by outward things and challenging our souls, challenging how our soul reads relationship with God. Its own desire to have God move in an outward way to prove that God loves us, for instance. That's the soul working. Prove that you love me. By the way, he's already proven it by the cross and by coming inside of us, even more so. So that's proof of the love of God. But the soul's not satisfied with that. It always wants something else to satisfy it. And the soul's re arena is the natural arena, the earthly arena. So it's going to seek after that that is visible, and I mean that in a physical way, that is hearable in a physical way, and it's going to want to be satisfied with more of that. And God is wanting to be life in the inward man. He wants to bring the truth that Christ is into the inward parts. And so the soul doesn't understand that arena doesn't like it, doesn't want it, doesn't appreciate it, doesn't understand it, doesn't grasp it, can't comprehend it. So when the Lord tells us that it's by His Spirit, He's not kidding. At all. So, uh, the preparedness that we must move forward into and I'll say it this way, God help my heart in this, but me to allow him to do what could be termed a quick work. It will not be quick in our sense of tomorrow, but over the next few years to do a quick work, to make a people ready for the, what has already begun, the soulish onslaught prophesied by the Apostle Paul and Timothy that would occur at the end of the age. 
what has already been occurring but will intensify as the age nears its end will be a soulish onslaught. If man, and he has, has craved uh, the things of this world to satisfy him, at the end that craving will be massively more than what it has been in any point in history prior to that point. So, preparation then at some point in time has to switch from simple outward thoughts of preparation. I've got guns. <laughs> I'm not saying it's wrong to have guns. I'm simply saying the thought processes of I know how to protect myself, I know how to do this, to great deception lies here at the end. And hear me when I say this to you. The only thing to keep God's people from that deception is Christ as truth in the inward man. Only. That will be the wisdom of God, Christ within, the wisdom of God, Christ being that wisdom, but in the inward man that keeps our hearts from the delusion of these last days, particularly religiously. Great delusions already in the church. Already. It's being welcomed. It's being accepted. Well, how do you see that, Terry? I can't see it. It's in the soulish arena to where the church has become outward and as outward as anything the world has to offer. So, we're going to look at a few passages of Scripture here, beginning in Matthew chapter 16, and then we'll go to some other passages, and um, I'll center as I share, not only tonight, but the other times I'm sharing this weekend, I'll center it around a simple little word. That word is the word build, build. And so uh, I want us to see it uh, in its context both in Christ and then see it in its context concerning the natural mind of man. So Matthew chapter 16 is where we're going to begin. Uh, you guys know this passage very well, but we're going to read it nonetheless. <clears throat> this is verse 13 of Matthew 16. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the question was, who are you saying the Son of Man is? Peter's answer is, you're the Son of God. just want you to catch that. It's a profound statement. I won't develop it as much as uh, what's said after here rings really, really true when you see that declaration being asked, uh, Jesus asking him and the others about the Son of Man, not bringing in the concept in this time of the Son of God. But Peter recognizing something that's quite beyond him and outside of his depth at this time. Peter didn't know the Lord inwardly at all here. He only knew Jesus of Nazareth. And he only knew him as the one who could work miracles. He knew him by his acts, outward acts. But as pertains to God's inward life nature, Peter knew nothing of that in any experiential way. That's because signs, wonders, and miracles don't change you and don't do an inward work. God does them, but they're not transforming to a person person can be healed by God. This has happened many times where God has healed people 
and nothing inwardly ever changed in that person. They just got healed, went on about their life. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying what signs, wonders, and miracles cannot do. And here's what they cannot do. They can't transform you into a new creature. Only Christ within can. A different life. So, um, verse 17, And Jesus answered and said of him, Christ knew very well this truth, Blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You didn't get this from yourself, Peter. That's what he's saying. As a matter of fact, only God can reveal God. We have to settle that issue. Man cannot reveal God. Angels cannot reveal God. Not his nature. Not who he is, his spirit. Only God can reveal himself. And he needs no outside help to do it. He is extraordinarily capable of revealing himself since he's the only one who can. Now, the good thing is he wants to. Amen? Isn't that good? Isn't that, 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 isn't that wonderful about his nature? That he wants us to know him. But having said that, the danger is knowing about him. The outward things is what attracts our attention. It's okay to attract our attention if we will go beyond them to the knowing of the Lord. But if it stops on simply out attracting our attention, then our soul is going to thirst for the outward more and more. You'll never see enough miracles to be satisfied in your relationship with God if that's what your relationship with God is, is about. You'll never have enough words spoken over you or spoken to you. You'll need more. You'll need more of the prophetic. You'll need more visions. You'll need more dreams. You'll need more visitations. I'm not here saying those things are evil at all. I don't believe that for a moment. It happens to me. It happens to some of you just like it happens to me. I'm simply saying this. To have all of that is still not to know him inwardly as life. It's to know him solically by what he can do. It is a setup by Lucifer. God clearly spoke that in the last days there would be a prophetic, let's use that word, release. You with me? Acts 2, the prophecy quoted out of Joel's prophecy. Satan knows that passage extraordinarily well and is going to offer and has offered and is offering a false prophetic not centered in the knowing of the Lord, not centered in the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, but in a prophetic that is very self-centered. Catch my language. Soulish-centered. A prophetic that's about you and how great you're going to be and your ministry and how God wants to bless you. God wants to raise you up to change the nations. What's wrong with that picture? I'll tell you who's missing. Christ. We don't need another Christ to arise. We need the real one to come inside of us. <laughs> I know in a better way, there's a lot of ways I could come at this and state what's going on and how Lucifer has introduced in our time the false, the counterfeit to what God promised in the last days. By the way, those promises of the prophecy and dreams was not what we would think it is in our modern dayism of prophetic movement. We're thinking, oh man, we're going to have all these visions. Well, what good's a vision if the Lord does not appear in it and we don't get to Him? What good is it? What use is it? What use is a vision for someone else if they don't get to the Lord? What use is healing if we don't get to the Lord? So we get our bodies healed so we can live our own lives. Think it through for a moment. 
Is God's intent in these outward acts not to get us into an inward relationship? I guarantee you it is. And at some point, he's going to wean us from the need, hear me, the need of outward acts. Not that uh, they're wrong, but our need for it, our own soul's desire to prove God by outward things rather than an inward relationship to where God is never doubted again. Even in the driest spell, you and I are bound to go through. I said it that way on purpose. Because you and I are going to find dry spells. God aims to bring them to deliver us, according to our own prayers, from our own soul. To get at our soul inwardly, he'll begin to restrict even visions, even dreams. There's no use asking God to get at your soul if we're not willing to go down a path for him to get at it. It's hard to discern our soul's reliance upon such things to prove God loves us, cares about us, is still with us, still in us. Hard to see it. Hard to recognize it. Harder to understand then, and I'm, I'm saying this because some of us are going through this. You go through a dry season. You think God doesn't love you anymore. You question the love of God. You question the fact, spiritually speaking, of Christ in you the hope of glory, all because, we're upset all because the nozzle was turned off on our soulish activity. So I want to point this out. Feelings will pass. They'll come and go. We'll need to grow beyond them. We'll need to allow the Lord to grow bigger than them. Outward manifestations will come and go at God's discretion, not ours. We must not be in charge of so-called, let's say it this way, of prophetic activity or we are already diluted. It's the wrong activity. If we are in charge of it, it's the wrong activity. Amen? Amen. Your imagination must never be a substitute because it isn't. For the revelation of Jesus Christ. Only God can reveal God. And the imagination is the curse of the modern prophetic movement. The curse. Because we believe the imagination is the gateway to revelation. When only God can reveal himself. And he don't need our imagination. <laughs> Amen. It's absolutely the truth. The imagination is the combination of man's soul and man's Self-life, his ego, of his wayward thoughts and his fallenness. That's where the imagination is coming from. God reveals himself by his spirit, not through imagination. Hitting this hard because of the teachings that go around about imagination. Use your imagination. I'm telling you not to because it leads to fantasy and then leads to delusion. Let me say that again. Your imagination will lead you to fantasy in spiritual matters. Such as I went up to the throne and I sat in daddy's lap. That kind of fantasy. And they had roller coasters up in heaven and John Wayne was making movies. They had Starbucks and they had this. That's all fantasy. So started with imagination, became fantasy, and now it's delusion. God reveals himself, and he's the only one who can. And what is our position? Passivity, because he's the only one who can reveal himself. Be passive and let him. Don't ignite it. Don't try to current turn the key of the ignition on. Don't try to start it. Receive. Receive. Believe and receive. I hope you find that helpful. 
lot of imagination in the church right now, and it's giving way to a fantasy world and the delusion that's promised to come here at the end. Paul says it in Thessalonians, that he, because they believe the lie, he will give them over to strong delusion. It is already happening, my friends. Again, God does not need our imagination to reveal himself to us. He needs us to believe and be passive in his ability to do it. We cannot. Amen. That's the truth. It's always been the truth, and it always will be. God is steering this thing, not us. Amen to that. He better be steering it, or it's really headed for a train wreck. <laughs> All right, let's go on. So <clears throat> now Jesus, knowing Peter and where Peter's at in this moment, he won't be here forever, but here's where Peter is in this moment. Peter recognizes that the Father has just revealed to Peter who he actually is as the Son of God. And so Christ says so. See, so here's what's happening. Peter, not knowing, suddenly knows. That's not imagination. It is exactly what is said here. My Father revealed this to you. No amount of imagination is going to get that going. It's not an imagination, it's the truth. And it took God to show it to Peter. Now, it's a revelation of Christ to Peter. It's as to who he is. It's not a revelation of Christ in Peter yet. It's to Peter. What I'm saying to you is it's non-transforming. It isn't transforming of Peter yet, is it? Not yet. You guys know this. Peter denies he ever even knew the Lord. Curses at the thought of his name. Curses those who are challenging him. Not that long after this. So uh, that's where watching miracles will get you. One moment... Because it's solical. This is the solical realm, by the way. One moment, the soul is the beauty realm. It's all things outward that are pleasing to the eye. All things that look delightful. All things that are intriguing. We see it in some of the, let me, I'm just going to hit this, some of the most creative people on this planet that has nothing to do with the Lord. Hear what I just said. But coming from the soul of Adam, now, in a fallen place. That's where it comes from. It is not the gift of God. It is not. But instead, the soul of man in a fallen place, life filled with this tree of the knowledge of good, which is only evil. The whole tree is evil. And so they have these beautiful words and beautiful things that they write and they say in one moment, the beauty of everything, and it just flows and flows. Oh, that's the Lord. It is not. It is the soul. And the next moment, they'll murder you. Now, you live in the city where that goes on all the time. All this so-called beauty that's invading Atlanta area. All this coming out of Hollywood. All this is coming into this city, pouring in from all the entertainment industry, and da 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 da. And oh, that music is beautiful, and this is so. This is such a beautiful thing. Just let me hit this for a second. There's the real that comes from God, and this ain't it. <laughs> and the poems and the literature, and da 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 da. It is the beautiful side of evil. That's what it is. That's what it started as. We'll get to that more when I talk more in depth about this. This is just kind of a roundup for a moment here of where we're headed with this to prepare our hearts, guys. This is not unimportant. It is serious. I'm telling you guys, the delusion of the last days is bound up in what I'm telling you. Satan, Lucifer, has is, is already begun. He's going to use the beauty realm of what is called in the church that the church has come to accept, the beauty realm of the soul to deceive the church. It has already started. 
the lack of discernment between soul and spirit, Hebrews 4, is clear in this. We can't discern between the soul and the spirit. We can't discern between our emotions, our sense of good versus God. So we tack God's name, oh, that was so the Lord. I felt the presence of the Lord. You felt the presence of your soul. <laughs> your goosebumps came from your soul. Anyway, that's too hard for people to hear. They get angry about it. I, I'm trying to help us. So don't get mad at the messenger. To understand some things. There is that that is born of the Spirit of God. And that's from God. And there's that that's come down through the bloodline of man that's from his soul life. Adam became a living soul. And in the fall lived entirely in his soul and still does. Void of God. Disconnected to God. That's the human race. Christ in you is the answer to that issue. But do not project onto the world that they have anything of God in the beauty realm that's of God. They do not. They have the soul and the beautiful side of evil. Such a lack of discernment in the church that we think, well, if it's beautiful, it's got to be God. I disagree, and I'll disagree forever. It is the tree of the knowledge of good from which man ate. This tree here at the end is going to be in full bloom in mankind. Soul life on an unprecedented scale will reemerge here at the end. There will be a worldwide system that welcomes the emergence of that soul life in all its beauty and in all its murder. Isn't it interesting that some of the most gifted people you know are some of the most unrighteous people you know? Tell me that's not true. <laughs> you guys are awful quiet. Go into those realms. I, I advise against it. Go into those realms, though. Look into the music industry, even the Christian one. They're in Nashville, Tennessee, and see what it's filled with. I'll tell you what it's filled with. It's filled with the exaltation of self. That's what it's filled with. In the Christian realm, just as much as it is in what we call the unrighteous realm. And once soul is set up on a pedestal, and it's right, once self is exalted, you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, what does not begin in the spirit is not of the spirit, and it never will be. And we need that discernment. Christ recognized where Peter is. He recognized his revelation, what the Father has revealed. And notice, it's not randomness in this. God is revealing himself in Christ to humanity. Why is it that these industries, the music industry, the entertainment industry is so against Jesus Christ. Should be uh, real clear to us because it's not of God. Because all that is of God comes to Christ. Recognizes Him. Recognizes the flow of who He is as the life of God. The beginning and the end. The Alpha and the Omega. So anyway, now, I'm loading this up on the self side, the soul side, the ego side, because that's where we are, heavily. I'm not at all denying the fact that there is a flow of the Spirit. The Lord gives my wife poems, and it's the Lord, some of you. God gives, comes from Him, His Spirit, flows and goes forth. 
But that's the key, isn't it? What comes from the Holy Spirit. Not the human spirit, the Holy Spirit. Not the human soul, the Holy Spirit. Not my intentions, not my good ideas, not I'm going to take my gift and use it for God. None of that nonsense. Let me say that again. Not I'm going to take my gift and use it for God. God will never accept it. If it doesn't come from the Spirit, He'll never use it. Say, so, oh, I don't believe that. I know you don't. That's why we're deluded. I'm telling you, there's an absolute in this, and Christ is it. By His Spirit. The vessel of God is by His Spirit. The flow of God is by His Spirit. The life of God is by His Spirit. The all in all of God is Christ in you and by the Spirit. So we're going to have here at the end, we're going to have this vast release, this thing called Babylon. In all its beauty, Revelation 17 and 18, but in the midst of it is the blood of the saints. It's going to move into a dominating place in the earth unlike any other time. It will cover the earth unlike any other kingdom. And I say this in its economics, in its political, it will cover the earth, its military power. It will cover much of the earth, not all of it, but much of it. It is going to offer to the church a piece of the pie. It's going to offer to finance the church. But it will be a deception. It will come in the beauty side. Well, you know, there's two aspects of this that I want to turn to for just a moment that are so deluding in the body of Christ. The first one is aesthetics. That that is outwardly beautiful, and the church loves it, by the way, in the present moment. They come into a sanctuary. Not this one, but... <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you glad? They come into a sanctuary and it's stained glass windows and it's pretty artistic work and it's gold and it's, oh man, I feel so holy in here. There is the deception of the church. There is the aesthetics, the deception of the outward. Let me get a little closer to home. We sit in music, just whatever music, not even talking about Christian whatever, but that too, sometimes. And so we, I've, I've been there, done that, and got the t-shirt for this, by the way. So you come into this beautiful orchestration of music, and the hairs are standing up on your arm. Oh, man, I feel the presence of the Lord. You feel the presence of your soul. I am not joking. Discernment is not in the body of Christ presently in this issue. We are moved by soulish things and soulish reactions. Not discerning. Source. What is the source? Is it by my spirit? Or does it have anything to do with God whatsoever? Aesthetics. I felt. Well, your feelings can change rapidly. I mean, know that. God cannot be judged by our emotions. He must not be. Cannot be judged by our feelings. It's not that you can't feel God. It's that God's not a feeling, though. And God is greater than a feeling. Believe me, you can feel the Lord. But a lot of what we're feeling is not the Lord. And we've become so programmed by feelings that are our Lord, feelings being our Lord, that we have no discernment between soul and spirit. We need what Hebrews 4 talks about. We need the Lord to bring a division between the soul and the spirit. He's the only one who can. And I'm going down this path tonight filled with opposition. You'll notice this. You'll find life filled with opposition when the Lord brings into your heart the discernment of the spirit to what has been begun in the spirit. 
and carried forward in the spirit versus what has been begun in the soul with man's flesh and carried forth in the power of ego self. There needs to be a revelation to our hearts to begin with that there is a distinction between soul and spirit that needs to be made in our own hearts again. And it's extraordinarily important that it be made in this time. And in discerning the will of God, we better know what is the will of God in this arena. We better know. And if we don't know, we may want to stop isn't that just hard to do? Stop and wait on the Lord until we do. Church is willing to do almost anything but stop doing. Doing has that kind of thrust to it, that kind of power to it. Surely not everybody out there can be wrong. There is a whole race of Adam out there that's wrong. What do you mean? Surely not everybody can be wrong. Tell that to Jesus Christ here, who's the only one in the world at that time who knows the truth. He's the only one that does. And people aren't going to know the truth until he comes inside of them, because he happens to be the truth that makes you free from deception. Isn't that right, Tony? Deception is not just I'm made free by knowing something. It's made free by knowing the Lord inwardly. It is the inward that will free us from the outward. The external delusions. Anyway, so, <clears throat> thus we see here with Peter, God's clear statement to Peter, this one here is the, not only the Son of Man, he is the Son of God. Jesus then says, on this rock, this revelation of himself, is the point. The revelation of Christ. I will build my church. The gates of hell won't prevail against that. I'll tell you what, the gates of hell has prevailed against the church bound up with its soul and has been extraordinarily successful up until this moment. The promise here that Satan would not be able to prevail against is not an outward thing at all, number one. It's an inward reality within a people. Isn't that true? Yeah. So we're going to look at some of this. Now we're going to move on here a little bit to the book of Ephesians. Cover a little bit of ground here. Verse, or chapter number 2, beginning with verse number 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. And having been, notice this word again, Jesus said, I will build now, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, that means Christ who they were speaking of, proclaiming. In other words, the apostles and prophets are not the foundation. Christ is. And Paul clearly says this to the Corinthians. There's no other foundation that can be laid but the one that has been laid, Christ Jesus. So this is not saying something other. Paul's speaking out of two sides of his mouth. He recognizes that the foundation is Christ and that the apostles and prophets were proclaimers of the person, not simply by theology, but by the manifestation of the life. Christ in them. Christ through them. The great need here, folks, is knowing the Lord, not entertainment. When is the church going to learn that? The great need for the world is knowing the Lord, not to be entertained. Church must not become an entertainment center or an imagination station. The church must not become that. There is a high heavenly calling in this, and it is the knowing of the Lord and leaders must lead by the example of that, the knowing of the Lord. 
Not the knowing of Him in a soulish way, however. Not the knowing that God can do things. Any devil believes that. We're in a battle for the life of, and the reality of this. It's not to be found in outward acts. It's to be found inwardly. And now what Luke 17, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is within you. While the church tries to compete with the outward things of the world that came from the soul of man, its high heavenly calling is to show forth Christ. That's not a meeting. That's not a time. That's not a place. That's not a gathering. It's a people whom the Lord is living in and whom the Lord is living through. And while the church thinks so much of its meetings, God is looking for life right inside you and I. And that life is in His Son. Actually is His Son. We are in a battle for life. Not gimmicks. Let it not be about gimmicks. There is no outward thing capable of transforming us inwardly. Of making us ready inwardly. But only Christ in us. So anyway, let me finish some of these passages here. So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together. Notice this into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So God's building a dwelling place, and it's not outward, it's a people. Now God's building a dwelling place. So when Jesus says to Peter, I will build my church, this is his definition. Paul's giving the definition right here in Ephesians chapter 2. The church is not outward. Now when Christ said to Peter, I will build my church, Peter had no concept of the church. That was a foreign thing in the mind of Peter. If you'd have walked up to Peter and said, hey, uh, Peter, uh, are you going to go to church this Sunday? Peter would have looked at you cross-eyed and said, what is church? If you'd have looked, walked up to Peter and said, hey, Peter, uh, do you have your Bible on you? He'd have looked at you cross-eyed. Number one, Peter couldn't read. He couldn't. Number two, there was no Bible-carrying people at that time. The manuscripts were tucked away in synagogues and in places that the common people had no access to. If you just talked to Peter and said, Hey, Peter, uh, what did you think about the worship service last Sunday? He'd have looked at your cross side. Just want to get clear with us here. God, help us not to project our present situation onto these people because what we're doing has no meaning to them and was never meant to have any meaning for us. That's right, I said it. The world's need is Jesus. Until they get him, they don't have what they need. They don't have who they need. Those of us who go outside this nation to other nations, I know some of you do, you go into situations where they have practically nothing. And all that we enjoy, they don't have. And what is it that's going to reach those people? Same thing that would reach these people, because most of these people in your Bible were one notch above slaves. Many of them actually were slaves. They were illiterate. Only 1% of the entire world at that time could read. Most of these people would live and die and never see a book. 
All of the self-help aids that are in modern Christianity, they knew nothing about. I'll tell you what they did know. He's called the Holy Spirit. And that's who we don't have. <laughs> they had the Holy Spirit producing the real thing of Jesus inside of them. And he was enough. He still is. They gave them the most simple but profound truth that heaven could ever give, Christ in you, the hope of glory. They believed that. And they didn't have to push through all the Christianized mess that's in our minds, all the religious garbage that's come up in Christianity. They gave them Jesus and he prevailed in their hearts, and they fell in love with him. I don't know, but that a dose of God taking everything away from us called Christianity and getting us back to the simplicity and purity of Christ himself would not be our solution. My question to all of us is, is that's what it's going to take. Is that what it's going to take for us to get back to Christ. Well, take a deep breath. This message will be over one day. But it's more than a message, guys. We've lost our roots. Tell me, have we gotten closer to the Lord since their time or further away from Him? The simplicity they had, and with it, sincerity. This hunger for a person. They didn't have all the stuff we have. They didn't need it. Neither do we. They had Christ, and he was enough for them. What's muddied the waters for us? Too much too many choices, too much stuff, too much counterfeit, too much I, the soul empowered, I need this from the Lord to prove. Given a chance, the Holy Spirit will do something within us, in Christ in us, that will bring a true inward peace that passes our understanding, that of the soul specifically. We must allow the Lord, must, this is a must. Deception is already in the ranks, has been in the ranks. And leaving us, God's people I'm talking to now, all of our hearts, open to deception and delusion by this outward religious concepts that we fight for. I'm not fighting for any of it. I'm fighting for the Lord to have a people. How about you? To have me here. God is building a people. Leaders so often are building a structure. Leaders are building an organization. Leaders are building that that pleases people, pleases man, because a man pleasing spirit's in it. Pleases the soul, gives man what he's hungry for in his soul. But God is only building a people inwardly, not structures, not towers of Babel, and not the city of Babylon. He's not building Egypt. And he wants an exodus out of it from our hearts. Christ being that exodus. (laughs) What a tough message, huh, Brian? (laughs) We've had hundreds and hundreds of years of this system. It has so indoctrinated us 
so infiltrated us so filled us with delusion that we think the church is this stuff that we brought have in modernism. A church building would not be found into the 300s when they started building church buildings. I'm not on an anti-building thing. I'm simply saying concepts concepts. I know you guys know this. This ain't the church. Aren't you glad? <laughs> and you don't come in here and say, oh man, I feel so holy in here. That's not what's going on. Holiness is never a matter of outward things to begin with. God is holy. And therefore, whatever is holy is because God's in it. And he doesn't dwell in what's built by men's hands. And said so. Any temple built by men's hands. But he is saying here that he dwells in us. Now, which do we want? Do we want God dwelling in a building or do we want God dwelling in us? God wants intimacy, not buildings. <laughs> God wants it personal. He wants us to be his dwelling place. That's what is said here. We are being built together into the dwelling of God in the spirit. Now, man's building buildings and God's trying to build his house and we happen to be that house. God's building us to be his house to forever dwell in. God aims to step away from heaven and come live inside of us and through us reign over his creation. That's the invitation that's in front of us. Heaven will lose its significance as God comes inside his dwelling place. That the throne God created isn't good enough for him because he created it. And he can create how many? As many as he wants to. How many heavens can God create? As many as he wants to. Well, what he can't create is the kind of relationship that's being described here in the Bible. That's a marriage. That's a union. That's a joining. That's a people who will allow God to live inside of them. That can't be created. But if we're willing, we can be built into it. The Lord asked me this not long ago. Why is it that my leaders are so bent on building a place when I'm trying to build you into my dwelling place? And says so clearly here and in other passages. Just for a moment, bear with me, but look in our nation alone. Look at the structures. Again, I'm not on an anti-building thing. I'm just telling you that the buildings aren't the church. We are. God wants to dwell in us. Think of the time. Think of the energy. Think of the resources that have been wasted on nonsensical buildings. Think of the, sorry, but think of the language we've heard. God told me to build this thing, and if he doesn't, he's going to kill me. I hope he does. <laughs> That's, uh, just thought I'd, for no other reason, for saying something, a stupid thing you just said. God's building a people. Man's building stuff. And what man's building is Babylon, including what is called the modern church. It's nothing more than religious Babylon. Now, I believe in the church enough to believe this ain't it. No outward thing is. So God's building a people, and we're being asked to pour our time, pour our energy, pour our resources. I'm looking at this nationally, now internationally as well. We're being asked to pour time, energy, resources into the stuff because without this, you know, something is not going to be done right unless we build this. And the church becomes a business. And non-spiritual men and women, talking about leaders now, non-spiritual by this definition, the lack of Christ in, or maybe Christ as a germ, a seed, a germ in them, and no, not any further than that. Rest of it, so much self, so much soul, so much energy of the flesh, so much hype, 
So much so that people discern, say, oh man, because that person was screaming and hollering and carrying on or whatever, that was really the Lord. But that's not true. You can be quiet and not be the Lord either. All I'm saying is Lord is not in outward things one way or the other. Silence or yelling, neither one of them is the Lord. Discernment is going to be needed in this time because Satan's going to do what he always does, and he's already well into this right now. As we are, I say it this way, here's my thoughts about it, as we are nearing the end of this age, we're seeing this. We're seeing people who are becoming increasingly dissatisfied. That's not a bad thing in and of itself. But they're dissatisfied in the church as we know it, as well as in the world. In the church, there is a dissatisfaction in this present time. The dissatisfaction lies around uh, meetings, lies around movements, lies around organizations, lies around institutions, lies around men, lies around women. A dissatisfaction, a growing dissatisfaction. It's already taking place. And because of that, Satan and his clever devices always causes a new thing, hear me, that is powerfully soulish to arise to lure the very hearts, actually the soul, but let's use the heart for a moment. Heart controlled by the soul. When the soul's in the ruling position of life, the heart is under its control. To lure those people into the trap. To the religious, he offers religious externalism to keep us from internal reality, which is eternal reality. You also have, that's not all, I'm going to hit this quickly, you have a minority, and it's always going to be minority. That's not the will of God, it is the choice of man. The will of God is whosoever will can come. The will of man is, I want what I want. And uh, if God's not high up on that uh, priority list, then we're going to go after our own stuff. This end is going to be quite the showdown, when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. When people go in search of security at any cost, as the church is being shaken, Satan raises up something in this world supported by its Babylonian economic system and says, you know, basically this, this is what's being said and it's what's going to be said, that all roads lead to God. The aesthetics will be there. The so-called outward beauty things will be in it to attract the souls of men through eye gate. Remember, Adam, his wife, was drawn to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because of its beauty, its pleasantness. Satan was appealing to the soul of man in the temptation of Eve. He could not appeal to the spirit of man because the matter would have been brought before God. But instead, Lucifer appeals to the soul of man, to the outward with the eyes and she sees that the fruit is pleasant and good and partakes. This is going to repeat itself here at the end. As Lucifer, religiously speaking, has a tree of the knowledge of good. Offering religious hearted man, man's soul, because the soul is extraordinarily religious. Not godly, but religious. Extraordinarily desirous 
if it believes that a God there is a God anyway, extraordinarily desirous to, let's say it this way, to be on God's good side through all outward means. I'm talking about outward activities. I'm not talking about inward reality. I'm not talking about holiness in the inward man. That's Christ. I'm not talking about purity in the inward man. That's Christ. That's why we can see all the outward beauty and such corruption on the inside, full of death. Beautiful things are in our nation, in Atlanta, in Nashville, in Los Angeles, throughout our country. Beautiful outward things. Oh, man, that's just lovely and that's beautiful. Inside is filled with corruption and deceit and soulish activities and an anti-Christ spirit. Anti-Christ in this, a replacement, a substitute for the Lord. Man himself is an antichrist. Left to himself. This is a heavy message, isn't it? To be prepared for the end, looks like to me it's going to be a showdown. You better believe there is. And the Bible speaks right to it. Delusion, deception, false signs, false wonders, false everything. Is going to be everywhere. How will we know the difference, Christ in the inward man? That's my whole point in this message. Christ established as the life in the inward man, truth in the inward parts, will be our only and best defense against the lies that are here and coming. Doesn't bode well for us right now, folks, when the church is already accepting of the lies. The church has already been infiltrated by the New Age movement. But it's been infiltrated for years and years and years by all kinds of outward things. This is my point in what I'm bringing up our history, when it's, where it started versus what we've come to. We've come to a very structured, organized thing, and people think that's good. People even think it's God. We've become a well-oiled machine. People believe that's good and actually believe it's God, religiously speaking. We've become something that the world can look on and say, oh, man, look what they're doing over there, when in actuality the world can't see the true church because it's an inward kingdom. They couldn't see Christ for who he was. Neither could anybody else without the revelation of the Father. And listen to me when I say this to you. And the church is Christ. That's who it is. Corporately speaking. God help us in this, friends. We've made the church everything but that. We've made it natural rather than the spiritual that it actually is. And it's spiritual because God, the true eternal spirit, is its life. There's eternal life. God in it. Not God giving eternal life. God giving his son. Who is eternal life? So anyway, I'm going to come to a close of sorts here. So there's this minority, though. Let's look at the minority. There's a minority who are equally dissatisfied, even could say discouraged and disappointed, but instead of being disillusioned, have turned to the Lord. And though it is a minority... Let me remind you of this. God does not win by many, not ever. Gideon found that out easily. You've got too many. Unless people believe that they win, you're going to win this battle by your own power, your own might, your own flesh. You've got too many, so I'm going to thin your ranks down from 30-something thousand to 300. Because we win because the Lord is the victor, not us. 
We win because greater is he that's within us, not us. We win because of Christ in us. We win because Christ has already defeated the enemy, but needing to be defeated in me. I mean, know the truth of that. Yes, Christ defeated the enemy, but the enemy's not defeated in me, including me, the enemy. <laughs> and the devil always aligns with the soul. That's what he attacked to the begin with. The soul is his avenue. The soul is his venue. The soul is his way. The soul is his truth. The soul is his life. There's going to be a minority who sees through the muck and the mire and all the talk of present-day Christianity and believes something. They believe that the Lord is salvation. They believe that the Lord is deliverance. They believe that the Lord is the truth. The Lord is the way. The Lord is the life. They believe that we're here to get to the Lord, not to enjoy a lot of stuff. They believe that the church has a high heavenly calling to be a dwelling place of God in the Spirit forever, beginning right now. <clears throat> they believe that the church is not here for a good time, that the church is not here for uh, all the stuff that the world has. They believe that we're here to be His, that He created us firstly to be His, and He wishes to possess us and to possess the reins. And the question that's going to come to all of us in this room is, will we be possessed? And if we're unwilling to be possessed, then we're unwilling to have the mind of Christ. And not being possessed will never allow us to have the mind of Christ. Fight for the stuff all you want. You'll find delusion to be its end. There are going to be a people who love him as he loves them. That his love in them, Christ, has initiated a love back to God. And that there's not a lot they can do for him, but they can grow in their love for him. And that if God was looking for a church to be built outwardly, he would have done it himself. And he'd have done a whole lot better job at it. Is that not the truth? That is absolutely the truth. Who's kidding who here? He who can create the universe by speaking it, if the church is an outward thing, he would have created it. That's exactly what he said to me directly. If the church is outward, I'd have created the thing. But the church isn't outward. It's inward. Amen. Folks, think about it on the beauty side of this. Here's beauty, that God is relational, and things he can create doesn't do it for him. Thank God. Otherwise, he could just dwell in heaven forever and be satisfied, but he's not. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. It's not that God has a need. If he did, none of us could meet it. That's his questioning of Job. If I had a need, you can't do nothing about it. <laughs> That's his interaction with Job. It has to be his interaction with us. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> God doesn't have a need. He's never known need, never will. But he has a will, and he has a desire, and he has a nature that is loving, and he wants to give himself. He wants to share himself. He wants to offer himself. He wants a marriage for his son. He wants a dwelling place, and we're created to be that. But see, I'm not talking about just man created. I'm talking about the new creation. Christ coming into us is to prepare the way for God's entrance into us, who Christ is. That's John 17, the Father and I will come inside of you and make our home. I want you to see the heart behind this, guys. I want the heart of God to rid us of this outward longing, outward yearning, outward desire for the stuff. I want a hunger for the person to be released in our hearts by the Spirit. I want to know Him, and I want to know Him right here. And it's not the things about Him. I believe God can do anything, don't you? But His doing things doesn't prove Him inwardly to my heart that He's a true Father. It's just that he's a creator. It's just that he's a doer. But to be a father, to be a lover, is something deeper than that, something more real than that. I hope you married for the right reason, and I hope love was the reason. 
I hope it wasn't so you could get something from the other person. Well, God's after the marriage and it has nothing to do with us needing something other than himself and him wanting us. Well, anyway, I'm just coming at it from every direction, trying to break down the stronghold that is in the people of God. We've had hundreds and hundreds of years of a theology thrown at us, taught to us, preached to us, and put in books of a building of the kingdom of God that is all outward, a building of the church that is all outward, works and works and works when the work of God is in us. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, teach us to do the works of God. This is the work of God. Hear me. It's what Christ said. Believe in him who God sent. That cannot be true. That's where the church is. Surely that's not it. Surely it is. The work of God is being proven to be in us. Good night, guys. He's already created the universe. How many trees have got to die before we realize the church isn't an outward thing? <laughs> there is a deliverance for God's people's hearts and with it a discernment to understand the will of God eternally. The will of God eternally. Let me say it one more time. The will of God eternally. There's a fight going on. It is in this city. It is with you as a people. There's a fight going on. Can we be satisfied? Is Jesus enough for our hearts? Is loving him, being loved by him, which sparks it. The love of God, Christ in me, begets a love back to him. That's the only way to work. We'll never be able to do it ourselves. It'll take Christ in us doing it. God will have to love through us back to himself. That's why Christ is the source of love. Christ is the source of righteousness. Christ is the source of truth. Christ is the source of spirituality in its entirety. No outward thing will make you spiritual, ever. Only Christ in you will. Doing spiritual acts will not make you spiritual. Not doing things will not make you spiritual. It will make you prideful. Christ is the sole source of spirituality. Psalm 87, all my fountains are in you. May God corral all our fountains in this room. Every hope we have other than Christ, because he alone is the God of all hope. May we come to see him as he truly is, not as the church has made him, not this small God that presently is standing in view in the church. The book of Acts is a testimony of a people trapped. They turn to God from their idols, trapped in years of idolatry, idol worship. Their concepts of prayer were standing, watching from the outside. There were no buildings to go into. As this priests of these, of these pagan religions performs their rituals in chants and incantations, and that's their concept of prayer. I'm looking at the Gentiles now. Their concepts of religion was unlike anything that we understand. And it had been going on for hundreds of years. So that their entire cultures were demonized in every sense of that word. And in comes one or two, usually two, who were sent by God with an extraordinarily simple gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what was the results of that? 
by the death of Paul. Men and women of God were established all throughout Asia Minor, over into Greece, even into modern Europe. continued to spread. They went through persecution after persecution as things moved forward, but they couldn't kill them. These were not systems and people in them. These were true believers who loved the Lord Jesus Christ and took it to the grave with them. Eaten by lions, lions sawn in two. You can read the book of Hebrews and read about their deaths. The crown has fallen from our head. Lamentations chapter 5. It is religion that has sucked us down the drain. We have lost the meaning of Christ, lost the meaning of church, lost the meaning and the purpose and the intent of God bound up with the people whom God is able to live in, able to possess, able to dwell inside, and through that people reveal himself. And man's hands have taken hold of that concept of church and twisted it and formed it and formulated it. And in the pride of man believing that God doesn't see or that God doesn't care and God's not concerned. Moving it away quickly from the eternal purpose that's been lost, isn't that right, Brian? Lost to the church. Moved it to the temporal, to the meeting. Church became a place we go to. Church became a time. Church became a day. Church became a place. Church became certain activities. And that's all Lucifer needed to do is move it from its inward reality to externalism. And we, like Eve, bit the tree and the fruit on it. It is not an easy thing to accept this great distance that's been created between the thought of God and what the church was meant to be and what the church has actually become. And we're all wrapped up in it. We're neck deep in it, all of us in this room. Every single one of us, neck deep in this. We've helped to propagate it, promote it, paid to keep it going. So, now I brought us to the brink of disaster, which is pretty much where we're at. Without the Lord, it'll only be disaster. The only one, and it is one, who can stop this madness is Christ. And for each of us to stop it is Christ in us. And for God to regather us to himself and not stuff. And not each other. Not firstly. But to him. In the days ahead, as been throughout the history, of what we call the church. When persecution comes, meetings are restricted. But it never stopped God's people before. They didn't need meetings to be the church. 
They just needed Jesus. And though you murder them by the dozens and by the hundreds and by the thousands, all of that was happening, you could never destroy them. And it will be so again. Christ, who is the church, is quite indestructible. That takes some defining. I'm just not going to do it yet. There's another time. My heart is to say this to all of us as a people. Say this to the city of Atlanta, the city of Marietta, all the surrounding towns and communities around the greater Atlanta area. God would invade our space and get right up in front of us if necessary to confront us over the fact that our hands and our hearts are on his church. And he would say this to us, that the bride belongs to the bridegroom. Take your hands off of her. Get your heart disconnected from wanting to Lord, rule, and reign, and direct what we now need the Spirit of God to do. There needs to be a healthy fear of the Lord bordering on what's called the terror of the Lord because the fear of the Lord's been lost. We can think we can do such things and it'll be okay. It will not be okay in the long run. If not in this life, certainly not in the showdown at the end. We need a healthy baptism of the fear of the Lord. It causes us to humble ourselves, to get on our face, and ask God to rewire us, to get our hearts inwardly back to Him, back full of the fear of the Lord, the terror of the Almighty. Not to run away and hide, but to run to Him quickly and unreservedly. If the Lord is to have a testimony that is unshakable here at the end, it'll be because God is allowed to move us beyond our present place and into a relationship and into an intimacy with Him in that relationship that is not founded upon outward things and not upon the soul, not upon the ego, the self of man but instead Christ and Christ alone. I'm asking for all of us here, myself, you, all of us. All I can say, Lord, I'm willing. I'm not saying anything to you that doesn't equally apply to me. It applies to all of us. To believe it doesn't apply to me would be foolish on my part and a deception. It applies to me as much as anyone in this room. It applies to Brian, to Angie, to Ken, to Donna, to my wife, Scott and Kathy and others, and Mike and Tony, and I know so many of you. It applies to all of us. The call that's now going out from the Lord is come out. Come out. Come out to me. Come outside the camp. Hebrews 13. Come outside. Follow the Lord outside the camp. Follow the Lord outside this present thing, this present system. Now, let me finish, and this is a finish by saying this. The, can we not meet? We can. But may our meetings become something more than a meeting. Now, I'm not talking about any of you in the room. We should laugh because I'm talking about all of us in the room. But if meetings have become quite boring to us, there's a reason. If we have found a resistance to our meetings, to our activities in the meetings, don't be too quick to blame it on the devil. I believe the Lord may be bound up with it more than the devil. Now, some of us are not even getting to go to any meeting, so you wish you could go to a meeting. And I want to say uh, thank God that uh, you don't have to get delivered from one because you can't go to one right now. <laughs> I know a number of people because they email me all the time around the world. 
man, Terry, do you know any church in our area that we could go to? Most of the places I don't know. I don't know of my concept of church, again, is not a meeting to begin with. It's a group of people who have been gathered to the Lord and are safe to gather together because their hearts are the Lord's. And the gathering doesn't become their God. It doesn't become their place for the expression of their gifting. What kind of nonsense is that? The church is not a place for the expression of people's giftings. The church is a place for Christ to be uplifted. Christ to be exalted in the hearts of his people. Anyway, don't get me started. That's the nonsense of the soul, though. I, man, we've got to have the meetings because I've got this gift. Anyway. Yes, we can meet and it be the Lord. If we can first meet, hear me, in the Lord. May God quickly draw us into Christ. And may we meet one another in Christ and have the relationship that he meant for us to have in Christ. I wish we'd had that opportunity when we got married, don't you guys? Some of us do, some of us didn't. Some of us never met in Christ before we met. And so we married not meeting in Christ. And there's been a very difficult road to follow a lot of that. But no different than the church. We met in a building before we ever met in the Lord. We met in a meeting before we ever met in the Lord. So I want us to stand for a moment. I was going to ask us to... Uh, How do you end? How do you end? There is no end to this, but how do you end? What is, uh, as you guys know, bigger than Atlanta, bigger than Nashville, bigger than our nation, bigger than the nations? A problem that seems at times to me over, quite overwhelming in the sense of we are so caught up in something, so in the web of it that we can't get free not even in our thinking most of the church can't imagine that God could do anything without them doing it for him God can't imagine that we could possibly think that we could do anything for him. Because he's clearly said to us in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. He hasn't changed his mind. I ask the Holy Spirit to make true spirituality to become real in us. That it's not a matter of my gift. It's not a matter of my talent. It's not a matter of my abilities. It's not a matter of me for Christ. But instead, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ in us. So we're asking, Lord, once again, to be a vessel filled with your life. And in your life is your intelligence. And in your intelligence is not only the fact of your eternal will, but how your will is brought to pass. I repent to you, Lord, for where I've tried to make your will come to pass in my own energy, in my own source, in my own abilities, where I believe that I could change someone else or believed I could change myself, that I could make myself in the least of ways 
by any outward activity more spiritual or less soulish. Come to you tonight, Lord, in the fact of our desperation. We need you, Jesus, to be what we can never be, to do in us what only you can do and you want to do, by the way. I want to say that to all of our hearts. He is all over this. His work was to bring that work right inside of us. And so it's way more his will, what we're talking about, to do in us than it's ever been through us. So, Lord, we open our hearts up and say, Lord, possess the reins, especially of my fears right now. Lots of questions. Have I run the race in vain? The answer may be yes, but it's not over yet. And there can be another chapter written here. Another chapter. God, give us another chapter. Give us a chapter called the end that is your ending and not our own. I ask for that, Lord. One final chapter. That may be all we have time for. But one final chapter that God writes and that God performs and that God does. And the power of Christ is exerted over all enemies and over all resistance, especially my own, to where, Lord, you become greater in me than me. And you become greater in me than what's in this world. And you become greater in your house, greater in your people, your house, yes. your church, your house, yes. your people, your dwelling place, yes. your people where your throne will be eternally set up. Yes. You become greater than everything, Lord, that we will ever face. I give you permission, Lord, to turn your power, the cross's power, inward upon my soul and to attack my soul and subjugate it until, Lord, it can become in time a useful instrument unto you. Not annihilated, a useful instrument unto God. We lay, Lord, our natural, let's just go there for a moment. We lay all our natural talents and natural abilities before you. Be that speaking, be that preaching, be that teaching, be that whatever it is. We just lay it before you, Lord. We willingly choose, Lord, to renounce it and allow by your spirit to become our reality in this. We believe this to be true, Lord, that without you, we can do nothing. We believe in absolutely, Lord, that that is the truth of this. That it's from you and through you and back to you. To God be the glory. That you're the initiator. You're the source. You're the sustainer. And you're the goal. You are all of those things, Lord. I pray our hearts will not grow weary in this time as God attacks our soul. I pray that our hearts will not grow weary, weary if we're in a time of a desert, of a dry spell, of a difficulty, when you're resisting us as to how we used to approach you. Help us not to grow weary in this time, Lord. That silence does not mean your absence. Rewire me away from the energy of my flesh in prayer. Rewire me away from the energy of my flesh in resisting the devil. Rewire me to where it is the Lord in me who is my victory, who is my deliverance, who is my sustainment. I, I, you may not want to pray when I'm praying because I'm telling you, he will confront our own energy and how we resist the devil. 
in order to bring us to a passivity to where it's greater is he that's within us. I'm saying more than what I'm saying in this sentence, these few sentences, but I'm trying to prepare us for something. If we're going to go after the Lord, the inward soul will have to be confronted as well as outward both. Are we ready to lose our own energy of our own flesh and of our own soul that we may know the Lord yes. and that he may become our all in all? To lose our human strength and never depend upon it again. Yes. That we may know Christ. who is strength. Help my heart in this, Lord. So much of this has not been spoken rightly about. So much has been to encourage our human strength in our resistance. I ask now, Lord, for your kiss to each and every one of your people in this room. Your kiss before the trial. Your kiss before the trying of our faith that you said is more precious than gold. certainty of Christ in us as the love of God when everything else around us is blowing up in our face. For some of us, that's really real already. Move us in our knowledge of God on final prayer to wisdom. That wisdom being truth in the inward man. Not a knowledge of God in our brain. Thank you, Lord. You are and you will remain faithful in all your dealings with each of us. We're simply asking, Lord, don't leave us where we're at. Let us go further with you in this journey of being possessed, possessed, possessed of the Lord. I think this is a safe dynamic for just a moment. Y'all know how I feel about this. You'll see how I feel about it more fully for a moment here. I, um, everybody be seated for a moment. Kathy, you stay standing. And I'm going to ask a question. If I, I'm dealing with women right now for a moment. If you're here and you're fighting physical bodies, uh, woman-type things, bleeding, and such things as that, I want you to stand up to your feet. Stand up. Now, Lord, you are the healer. You don't just heal. You are that. As the healer, I ask you now to be healing, physical healing, to my sisters and your daughters. Like the woman with the issue of blood, I ask you to be the healer. An internal physical issues 
within the ladies that are standing, perhaps others that are sitting. Even in the bladder, perhaps especially in the bladder, I ask now, Lord, you to be the healer. I say that because I've seen the bladder. Maybe that sounds strange, but be the healer that you are, Lord. As you bring divine order to us in the spirit, bring it to our bodies as well. May our bodies line, align with what is true in the spirit. We ask for that. Especially as that pertains to health, mm. physically speaking. Mm. Now this is a little, I don't know how to say it. So if I mess up saying this, may the Lord make it real to your heart what I'm trying to say. I ask, Lord, for you to be the healer of bacteria mm. and germs that are, that are not supposed to be in these bodies you to remove the bacteria bacteria and germs and be the healer Now, supernatural strength, Lord. Pray this particularly for you, Kathy. Supernatural strength to your body physically. To where you awaken in the morning and you feel the refreshing in your body. Energy in your body. And the sapping ceases. And God's strength is realized and renewed inwardly, physically now, I pray. And others of you standing. Thank you, Lord. This is, uh, again, I'm just going to put it out there general rather than being specific. Uh, the deterioration of bone. And uh, if you have some of that going on, I want you just to stand to your feet. If there's been bone deterioration going on in your body and you know of it, I want you just to stand to your feet. Uh, some of this is centered around our rear, end, our rear ends, <laughs> the lower parts there. I guess that would be the butt bone, huh? <laughs> I'm not trying to be joking. I'm just telling you. I'm having the vision of it. How would you like to have that vision? <laughs> have it if you want it. <laughs> so now, Lord, I ask for healing in the bone structure. and the miracle of healing in the bones to reconstruct what has deteriorated. And in this area of the butt bone, there's no better word to say than that, where <coughs> there's pain associated with this, I ask for you to be the healer there, Lord. receive of you in that, Lord. 
structurally speaking, inwardly speaking in the bones, we receive. You who created it to bring full repair to it now. So we thank you, Lord. Wait on the Lord a second. The presence of the Lord in the room. He's in the room. As well as among us and in us. I think this is the final thing I want to pray for. This is physical again. Um, this is concerning the eyes, light sensitivity to the eyes. If that's you, just stand up or stay standing. Light sensitivity to the eyes. I'm not sure what's causing it. I'm just, the Lord's saying it, so showing it to me. Whatever has been the cause of this and is the cause of this now, Lord, we ask again, you who created, you are the healer. You are that, Lord. And we don't want to forget you in the healing. We come to you as the healer. Heal our eyes. We ask, Lord. Thank you for being our healer, Lord. Let's just say that to him. Thank you. You are something to us. You're our creator. You're our God and king. And you're our healer. We thank you, Lord. We worship you. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Tara. That was powerful, powerful, powerful message and powerful ministry. And anyway, just so, so good. Just uh, I want to take up an offering real quick and uh, have the ushers come up for that. Just want to encourage you to give generously. You know, just want to bless Terry. You know, just the way he pours out to just speak the truth and just allows the Lord to use him as a vessel to bring the people of God to where we need to be. Um, anyway, I just want to encourage you to give as we get the buckets ready. Uh, we, I, I want to make a couple of announcements just really quick. Um, first of all, if you want the CDs for the conference, we're going to have them available $3 per session in the bookstore. If you want all the sessions, they're going to be $12. Uh, the other thing is we are going to post these videos to our YouTube channel. I don't, I'm not sure exactly when they'll be available, but if you go to videos.restorationlife.org, you, you can get the videos uh, of this conference. And the, the last announcement I'll make is I want to encourage you if you haven't yet got Terry's book within the circle of the throne, I want to encourage you to get that book. It is a powerful, powerful book. It's a life-transforming book. 
Um, if you haven't read it yet, I do encourage you, uh, they're out in the, the foyer, to get, that, to get that book and read it. It, it is life-changing. It really is. So let's go ahead and we'll take up the offering. And uh, just want to encourage you to give generously. Amen. What do we make checks to? Uh, make checks out to Restoration Life. Yeah, Restoration Life. But yeah, just do want to encourage you, get, get that book. Uh, I've read half of it, and uh, it is, it, it's, you know, it's one of those books that you can't read when you're tired. You, you know, for me, I can't read it at night because I'm tired, and it makes you really think. Um, but in the morning when I read it, just, it's, it's, every sentence is just powerful, powerful, powerful. It is a really uh, a precious gift the Lord has given us. Um, and then a couple, uh, one other thing, just remember tomorrow morning is at 10 a.m. So we have tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. and then tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So anyway, God bless you. Um, hope to see you tomorrow and we'll just pick, uh, carry on with what the Lord has done. Amen.